Welcome to the online service for Oak Park Church of Christ for January 17th, 2021. Thank you for joining us this morning. I invite you to uh, read along a call to worship from Psalm 91. We'll read uh, responsively by verse from verse 1 to 6 of Psalm 91. I'll begin. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Oh, oh, oh. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone. Higher than my sight. High above my life, I will trust in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Whom you love, I'll love. Out you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose. Well, welcome once again. This is uh, week number three in our sermon series, The Church in a Hot Mess, where we're looking at chapter 6 to 10 of the book of Acts. Uh, we're picking up the story this week, right at the beginning of chapter 8, and we're going to dip back a little bit into chapter 7 and read just the first uh, eight verses of chapter 8. A big difference from last week when we tried to take on more than a, a sort of chapter and a half, a long chapter and a half. Of the text and so we get to focus in a little bit more this week let me open with a word of prayer father we give you thanks we give you thanks for your word 
this morning as we read it together, as we open our hearts and our minds and, and listen to what you have to say to us, we're reminded of the challenging and hard call of discipleship. And that you are always with us in the world, that even when we're not sure how you're at work, we trust that you are at work. We thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for the history of your people who have, um, in the face of trials and persecutions, endured and brought the gospel message to this day. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I want to begin this morning by um, firing some facts at you. Each year, uh, Open Doors, which is an organization that looks at persecution of Christians uh, across the world, releases what they call a world watch list, which sort of uh, brings to light the countries where it is most dangerous to be Christians in. And they have several different categories, several different uh, kinds of analytics and, and facts that they give in their report. Uh, it's an extremely difficult report to read, but it's also, in my opinion, a, an extremely important report to read. So let me just um, give you some highlights from the World Watch list in 2021. This is uh, reflective of, of last year, 2020. Every day, every day, 13 Christians lose their life in the world because of their faith. Every day, 12 churches, church buildings, are destroyed because they are church buildings. Every day, 12 Christians are unjustly imprisoned because of their faith. Another five are abducted every day for being followers of Jesus. 40% of Asian Christians right now in the world face persecution because of their faith. In Africa, the number is nearly 20% of Christians face persecution. And in fact, the highest percentage, we don't even have an actual percentage for this, but uh, those Christians that are following Jesus in the Middle East, well over half. In fact, if we take Christians worldwide, would you believe that more than 10% of Christians worldwide are persecuted actively because they are followers of Jesus? And you might think, well, these are probably mostly all in, in Islamic majority countries that are, are persecuting Christians. That's not actually true. In fact, in the list of just the top 50 countries where Christians are persecuted, there are Islamic state countries. There are also Buddhist state countries, Hindu state countries, and atheist and agnostic state countries. Worldwide, worldwide in 2020, registered martyrdoms rose to 4,761 last year. That's up 60% from the year before, where there was 2,983. By the way, in case you've possibly seen different numbers or you're wondering about the numbers, uh, across the board, Open Doors is known to be the most conservative. Uh, they, they're not estimates. These are actually verified martyrs, those killed for their faith. Uh, some, even reputable some sources, have martyrdoms almost into the six figures, 100,000 every year. An interesting note that Open Doors put in the report this year is that COVID has actually heightened an older form of persecution in an extreme way over the last year. Whereas uh, there are Christians in minorities in these countries, they were largely overlooked or persecuted by not receiving aid, whether from international aid agencies or from their own country, because they were followers of Jesus. And so when supplies were rationed, when the need was there, Christians were overlooked or they were shunned. Let me read you a quote from the report. The global pandemic made persecution more obvious than ever. Simply because so many people needed help, the clear discrimination and oppression suffered by Christians in 2020 must not be forgotten. Add to this the reality that COVID 
has allowed countries, especially countries like China, to increase their surveillance in ways that they were even before not able to do. Some provinces in China are reporting uh, increased surveillance to the point of face recognition that they are being tracked. Their every move now by the government because these COVID protocols have allowed this to be put into place. Again, in the summary report, it notes that the number of nations worldwide that now register in their metrics as quote-unquote very high, there's extreme, very high, high, and then down from there. Either very high or extreme is the most ever. It's the first time that these these 50, this list of 50 countries identified as the the worst places for persecution for Christians are all either very high or high. And in fact, there's 54 countries in total that register that way. Friends, the trend toward a peace-loving world is not a reality. And I would suggest that even for us in the Western world that maybe think it's trending this way, we both need to wake up to the reality of what is going on in the world, but we also need to be aware that the trend even here is not toward a peace-loving world where everyone gets along. I don't think we're going to be immune from this type of persecution in the future. The truth is we would prefer not to think about these things, right? Oh, it's okay for for the classroom. You can talk about it in in the classroom, but uh, oh boy, why are you bringing this to us on Sunday morning, right? I had a a friend um, years ago who was an old retired pastor, and he didn't like my preaching very much, and that's fine, that's okay, never really bothered me. But I remember one comment he made to me after a sermon I preached. He said, oh, you just, you just really brought too much reality. He said, what we need on Sunday morning is a good dose of encouragement. Struck me as sort of the opposite of what the gospel brings. The gospel brings hope in spite of reality. We have to be realists as Christians. We're not called to be idealists, right? I want you to keep these stats and this reality in mind, as we, uh, as we turn to our passage this morning, I invite you to open your Bibles, if you have them with you, to uh, Acts chapter 8. The Scripture will be on the screen, on the slides. You remember uh, last week that we looked at the story of Stephen, one of those Hellenist leaders that uh, rose up in the early church. And he was preaching boldly in the Greek-speaking synagogue, the Freedmen Synagogue, and he's brought before the Sanhedrin on trumped-up charges And we uh, just sort of left it hanging at the end as he's brought out and he's stoned and he's killed. Chapter 8. On that day, on the day of Stephen's lynching, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy. In the city. Once again, here, like chapter 7, we see a little bit of mix of, uh, of Luke weaving in great joy, good things, celebrating what is happening with the reality of persecution, of harm, and even death in the church. As this morning's message is the first of three that we're bringing on uh, Acts chapter 8. The first window into some of this uh, work of the Hellenist leaders in and amongst the area around Jerusalem. It is the first sort of fulfillment of that that roadmap that we saw in chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus says, look, this gospel is going to go from Jerusalem to Judea and all of Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. And Luke inserts this sort of tangent, this window into the beginnings of this work 
in Judea and Samaria here. And so I'll throw a map on the screen. You can see just a little bit about how it's not scattered too far, right? Samaria is just north, and so when it says he goes down to Samaria, it really means sort of like I would go down to Edmonton. It's north of where Jerusalem is, but not too far away. Well, again, in the last message of our series, we saw uh, how Stephen's sermon to the Sanhedrin, that's what we called his, his speech, his defense before the court in Jerusalem, sort of opened the door of possibility that the gospel could spread beyond the city of Jerusalem. That is, we looked at how Stephen said, it's not tied to the temple like you think it is. God doesn't solely or alone reside in the temple, but actually he is in the world. And so, uh, as people of faith, we can go anywhere in the world and worship Him properly. And so we have this crack of possibility that the church can expand beyond that great city. And now with Stephen's lynching, his stoning, his death after the fact, his death has sort of opened the door of necessity. (laughs) We've moved from his speech saying, look, it's a possibility to go beyond here. We're not tied to the temple itself to necessity of, we really need to get out of Dodge because we're being persecuted. They're chasing us. They weren't just free to move beyond the walls of Jerusalem. They were forced to move beyond those walls. Let me just pick up one more connection from from Stephen's long sermon before that Sanhedrin. We talked about how he retold the history of Israel in two different ways. And the first way, he sort of told it through the great leaders, the great figures, the, the patriarchs of Israel. And one of those figures was Joseph. You remember Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. And, and Stephen says, look, uh, what, what our forefathers planned for evil, God planned for good. Joseph was sold to Egypt. He re- rised up in the ranks, became second in command to Pharaoh himself. And when God's people were experiencing a drought, his brothers came back to him, and Joseph was able to save them. He was a a deliverer, a leader for the people. Well, Stephen doesn't quite quite quote uh, Joseph's exact response, but I, I have to think that it was in the back of his mind. You see, it's like Jesus said in Luke chapter 19, even if these people stay silent, the very stones will cry out of the good news, right? Well, it's those stones that crushed the skull of Stephen that were bloodied and lay discarded around just outside the city of Jerusalem that were calling out with those words of Joseph, what you planned for evil, God planned for good. To bring it about that many people should be saved. Friends, how God works to us is often a mystery, isn't it? We're often trying to figure it out and and to discern where God is at work and what He's doing and what He's up to, but often in hindsight, we're able to see so clearly God was there. He was with us. He was at work in ways we didn't even know. He was bringing about things that we couldn't even have foreseen. And that's a lot of what is going on in the early church in the book of Acts as we pick it up. Let's talk a little bit about these eight verses at the beginning of chapter 8. It's about the the dispersion and the persecution of that early church. But there's a few questions that it, it sort of brings up for us that I think we should unpack. It says, A great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. The first question is this word, all. I brought this up before in our our series earlier on the book of Acts, but Luke tends to use this word all to mean most. I know that sounds sort of misleading. It's a a little bit of hyperbole, but it actually becomes very clear in the text. And in fact, as we read through uh, the book, if we pick up a few chapters later, Acts chapter 11, we hear Luke saying, look, now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Here it's very clear that Luke isn't assuming that all of the Christians were scattered by the persecution, but those that were scattered traveled to these cities. And in fact, we can surmise by the fact that these were major Greek-speaking cities that probably the persecution was harshest in Jerusalem against those Greek-speaking Christians. 
That is, those who had chosen Stephen as one of their leaders. This makes sense. As we know, the the Greek-speaking synagogue, the freedmen synagogue, was in turmoil over the gospel. It also sort of helps us understand why the apostles might have stayed in Jerusalem. After all, that seems rather bizarre, aren't they, the leaders? I mean, if the church, all the church scattered, shouldn't they be scattering as well? It sort of leaves us with maybe two possibilities of why they stayed in Jerusalem. Uh, Presumably, as we just said, the harshest persecution was against those Greek-speaking Christians. The apostles probably didn't receive as much persecution as those who had met in that freedman synagogue in Jerusalem. And because of that, they likely saw it as a continuation of their calling to preach the gospel to the lost sheep of Israel, that they ought to stay in that center and continue to evangelize. The other option that we have from what we know in the text is that they could have felt like the most dangerous and costly form of leadership was actually to stay there with those who who couldn't disperse, who couldn't scatter, and, and protect them with everything they had. My personal take on this is, is it was probably a little bit from column A and a little bit from column B. They probably weren't persecuted as much as the Greek-speaking Christians, and they probably saw it as, as their uh, mandate to evangelize that city and stay with the Jewish people and protect those who weren't able to scatter from that place. It does, as I said, seem very likely that the persecution mentioned here after Stephen's death is primarily directed toward those Hellenistic Christians and probably mostly by Hellenistic Jews. It probably continued on, increased uh, from those disputes that happened in the Greek-speaking synagogue. In fact, I would suggest that uh, a lot of those leaders that were persecuting the church were probably those who had been bested by Stephen and his wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, in those debates. Why am I saying all this? Well, I think it leads us to Saul, or who we normally call Paul. You see, it says he was one of the chief persecutors. Uh, In the painting I'll put on the screen here, you'll see, I showed this painting last week, it's it's of the stoning of Stephen, but you'll notice who's actually front and center in the painting? It's Saul, right? He's there, they've laid their cloaks at his feet, as we hear in the text. He likely was a leader in that freedman synagogue, the Greek-speaking synagogue. He was from Tarsus in Cilicia, which is sort of on the, um, on the southern coast, well, the northern coast of the Mediterranean, the southern part of modern-day Turkey. And we know he was a Roman citizen. He was likely uh, the great-grandchild or great-great-grandchild of, of one of the slaves that had, uh, Pompey had brought back to Rome from Jerusalem. And, uh, and he had Roman citizenship because of that. The text tells us in, in chapter 7 that he was consenting to the death of Stephen. That is, he's not a, a mere innocent bystander. He didn't just happen to catch the stoning of Stephen, but he was there sort of egging them on, if you will. In fact, I would suggest that he was probably one of those who brought up charges against Stephen. He very well could have been one of those bested by Stephen in the synagogue, which is sort of so fascinating for me to think about. When you think about uh, how great Paul is, the Apostle Paul, later in his letters and and in, in, in the book of Acts, and we hear about these great speeches that Paul's speaking in these great centers in the ancient world, and that he was probably bested by Stephen in those debates. It says that Paul was going house to house at the blessing of the leaders in Jerusalem, persecuting followers of the way. The way is what they called followers of Jesus in Jerusalem at the time. It says in verse 3, Paul began to destroy the church. The word in the NIV, destroy, is is probably not quite as harsh as it should be. The ESV, I like that translation a lot. It says he was ravaging the church. The connotations here is he was intending to ruin or destroy the church entirely. It's graphic. After chapter 8, we pick up in chapter 9, the very first thing that Luke tells us is that Paul was, or Saul, was breathing out murderous threats. 
upon the church. Uh, those weren't empty threats. You see, Saul was, he was a leader of some type of sort of death squad that was doing house sweeps, looking for those little cell groups, those little house churches of the followers of the way so that he could drag them out, beat them, or kill them. Now, in light of all this, I want you to consider for a moment Paul's words to the Philippian church. He writes to the, to the church in Philippi from in prison, in shackles, in chains, because of his own preaching of the gospel after his conversion, his own persecution. And he begins his letter this way. He says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. How does Paul come to this realization? That him being locked up in chains, in jail, has actually served to advance the gospel? Well, I think he, he comes to this realization because he saw it firsthand. He was the, the chief persecutor. He knew what happened when he persecuted followers of the way. It actually fanned the flame of that early church. The sentiment uh, isn't just found in Paul, and in fact, it isn't just found in the New Testament. This idea gets expanded in the early church, especially the first three and, and four centuries of the early church when Christianity is illegal. One of the great quotes we have is from a church leader in North Africa who was being persecuted. His name is Tertullian. He writes this, Kill us, torture us, condemn us, grind us to dust. The oftener you mow us down by you, we are mown down by you, the more in number we grow. The blood of Christians is seed, he says. I find that so interesting that he would use that image, that the blood of Christians is seed, because that's exactly how our text talks about it this morning. You see, when we talk about uh, the, the followers of the way being dispersed into Judea and Samaria, that's the, the image it's an agricultural term. It's like seed being sown in a field, thrown about. The blood of Christians is seed. Like seed sown in a field. The persecution by Saul in the church of Acts acted like a wind fanning the flame of a prairie fire. Right? You ever seen the wind catch a fire, a grass fire? And how quickly it picks up speed. How quickly it grows and expands. How quickly the flames engulf everything. The early Christians are sent out from Jerusalem, pushed out from Jerusalem as refugee missionaries. That's what they are. I want to come back to Paul again because we pick his story up again in, in chapter 9 in the sermon series in a few weeks. You see, Paul knew both sides of this coin. He was the chief persecutor. He was also the chief persecuted, right? And I want to just bring out maybe his most explicit uh, theological explanation of persecution and suffering. It comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. He says, look, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Everyone. While evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. How from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That word wise just makes me think of you know, envisioning Paul debating Stephen and realizing that Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, was just far too wise for him in knowledge of salvation in Jesus Christ. Uh, I want for the rest of the message this morning to sort of pivot a little bit. I want to pivot maybe a, not necessarily away from the book of Acts, but I want to use our scripture this morning to ask some very contemporary questions. Not necessarily early church questions, but questions that have come back into play. And the basic question I want us to look at this morning is, has this pandemic 
brought with it persecution of the church. And here, what I'm talking about is not necessarily the world watch list that I read you the stats at the beginning of the message this morning. Uh, It's very evident that it has brought persecution on Christians worldwide. The question I want to bring is to us here, right now. Has this pandemic brought persecution upon the Western church, or we might even say church here in Calgary? Uh, We obviously have people who have claimed uh, on both sides of this very passionately here even in our own city. And and I'm not going to sort of pick a side and go with it. I'm actually going to look at at both answers and how we can uh, actually claim truth in both of the answers in a certain way. The first one I'm going to qualify quite a bit, though. So if we say yes, that this global pandemic has brought with it persecution of the church, persecution of Christians, I want to say that I can affirm that yes, it has in a certain way. I want to make a very qualified yes here. I I can't go all the way and suggest that there's some sort of intentional, sinister plan at work, that there's you know, a, a cabal of evil people that have planned this, that are, that are you know, unleashing it in order to persecute Christians and the church. That's not what I'm trying to suggest when I say yes here. Uh, but intentional or not, willed by human agents or not, we have found ourselves in a place that has severely inhibited our ability to be disciples of Jesus. And so, uh, whether we want to say that it is explicit persecution, this pandemic, or whether we want to just say that we are experiencing similar results or similar outcomes from what persecution in the church has brought, I want to affirm that. I think that's true. You know, later in Acts, in chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas are are traveling around as missionary refugees and they're preaching the gospel. And in one city, Paul is actually stoned. He's stoned and he's he's left for dead. They think that they've killed him. But he revives and he goes from that city and moves on. And it says he comes back to the same city. The city is Lystra. And he's encouraging the believers there, the, the converts that he's made. He says, look, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of heaven. This pandemic has not brought stoning upon us Western Christians. That's not what I'm suggesting. I want to be very clear about that. But I think it's true that we can still affirm what Paul says here. This is still very true in our own context. That we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of heaven. We're we're dislocated from our preferred way of, of doing church of being disciples in our community. uh, Our options have been limited in severe ways. I want to get a a little bit more specific here in just what I'm talking about. I want to look at the five missional priorities that we focus on here at Oak Park. These are five things that we say, these are hills that we will die on. These are things that we are about that we're not willing to give up. We want to invest in these things. And so we even shape our budget around these five things. Let's talk about these for a minute. We say communal worship. We will never stop worshiping. We will never stop gathering. We will not neglect gathering together. In fact, it's one of the things as a church we've identified as our priority during COVID. How can we continue to meet together for encouragement and worship? Well, it's been restricted. It has been limited. Truthfully, if we're honest, it's sort of been a shadow of what it was prior to COVID. Our numbers are severely restricted. Our fellowship time before and after our gatherings on Sunday is non-existent. Our singing is non-existent except for in-person Shelley's in the cage and you get to participate at home. I should clarify, if you haven't been in person, we don't actually put her in a cage. She sings in the drum cage, all right? Very different. (laughs) Just realize that might be a very bad mental image. We're all forced to wear masks when we gather together in person. We can't see each other's beautiful smiles. And of course, uh, most of us are still worshiping virtually, online, which is wonderful and it's a great tool, but we all know that it's not the end game, that it's not the best case scenario. Uh, What about life together? 
our second missional priority. That we will build community within our church. That we will do our life together. Our seniors' lunches have been canceled. Our intros to the park have been canceled. Our life groups are either online in some form or they're on hiatus completely. Church picnics, social event, coffee before and after service, right? All of it changed, different. We're not even even able to do outside gatherings at this time. What about community service? That we will be uh, salt and light to the community, to to the neighborhood around us. Well, I'm very proud to say that you have uh, been incredibly creative and resilient in this area. That, That our people have said this is a priority that we're not willing to give up on. In fact, there is greater need in our community right now, and so we are going to be as creative as we can to continue fulfilling this missional priority. But we've had to adjust everything we do. Everything we do in this area has felt like it's going uphill, that there's challenges to it. We're still able to do the clothing rack, but it's limited hours, it's limited people, and Ken and Doris have put an incredible amount of work into that ministries for Wednesday mornings. We're still able to do our food bank. In fact, we did the most ever food banks we've ever done last year, but we're not able to do our big group packs. We're not able to do it together. We're not able to be as efficient as we once were. And so Mike and Carrie have, have worked hard to make sure that we can still do that in creative ways. The same thing with our Lifeline meal pack that we did last year that we're planning to do again this year. Uh, We were able to do a gift drive for our community before Christmas, but again, had to be limited in in how many people. We couldn't do it all together. It was a real challenge about how to pull it off logistically. All right, our fourth missional priority, global partners. Uh, Many of our global partners are home from the field. Uh, Many are working hard to find ways to adjust to to carry out their mission, their work in creative ways via internet or with partners on on the ground, wherever they are. But again, it's been more difficult, more challenging, more limited than we've ever had with our global ministry partners. And finally, our next-gen ministries. And this actually, for me, has been the most difficult part of COVID and, and creatively thinking through ministry and mission here at the church. We've had to stop youth group right now. They aren't meeting. We've severely limited our kids' park and how we are able to do that. Uh, Things like our youth missions trip are completely off the table. And Sarah has worked extremely hard to ensure that we can do what we can do in creative ways. Uh, But it is really, again, a sort of shadow of what we were once able to do. And I, I struggle with the fact that are we in some ways failing our next generation, our kids and our youth and our young adults, in not able to provide what they need for discipleship at this time. And so in a very similar way to overt persecution, we're being forced and we're being formed in a fire. In a high pressure, crisis and chaos type situation. Now, we don't have maybe a chief persecutor that we're able to blame and point the finger at, but maybe that makes it even a little bit more difficult in some ways. Uh, There is no really faced enemy that we can point to, except, of course, the great enemy who is loving this, who is wanting churches to fold, to close up shop, to say it's too hard, it's too difficult to do ministry in this time. You see, crisis and chaos have a way of of stripping away. They have a way of of revealing what is truly underneath, what is our true nature and character. And the season that we're going through in the middle of COVID is actually doing the exact same thing that persecution does. It's revealing our true priorities and our real character. My grandmother had um, great dating advice from my mother. She said, Whenever you date a boy, make sure that you watch him play a competitive sport. And the reason for this is that when we're in these high-stress crisis situations, these highly competitive situations, it reveals our true character. We actually see not just others for who they are, but we see ourselves for who we are. Not just who we 
say we are, not just who we want to be, but in fact who we actually are when the rubber hits the road. Some pundits and and futurists have suggested that out the other side of COVID, we're going to see what they call a great exchange in the church. What do they mean by that? Uh, They mean that uh, through this crisis and chaos, through through this sort of refining season, what's going to happen is that there is going to be many people who leave the church. Uh, Nominal Christians. Christians in, in name only what we might call cultural Christians. Christians that have sort of grown up in the church, knew nothing different than the church, never really been challenged in their faith. And when crisis hits, global crisis of this scale, it's going to see them walking out the door, realizing, ah, I was only there for habit. When things got hard, eh, it wasn't really a priority for me. But they suggest that at the same time, there will be many people that enter the church that realize that that what they've invested their life in is is actually a bankrupt project. And they need to invest their life in something more grounded in truth, something more meaningful, something more worthwhile. And they'll find the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they'll find the grace of giving up control, giving it over to Jesus. They'll find the calling of discipleship a worthwhile calling to pursue in their life. I don't know. (laughs) I'm no futurist. In fact, if I'm honest, I think it's probably a little rosy of a picture for the Western church. I hope that something like that happens to those who are experiencing, who are going through this in society, who who have never really considered the gospel or even heard the gospel, but that it actually confronts them and arrests them in a new way. But if I'm truthful, I think probably the Western church is in for a lot more darker days than even now. If I'm even more honest this morning, I think uh, what we've seen through the last year almost of this crisis is uh, even more troubling at the pastoral level. That, That it has been ultimately revealing of what the leadership of our church has been. And by the way, I'm not excusing myself from this i'm putting myself in this situation you see the pastoral response i think has mostly been filled with insecurity and what i call a shotgun approach that is there's been a profound worry amongst pastors that what this will all look like when things begin to improve when we maybe get back to normal Who will return? What will my church look like? What will we be facing? What will the challenge be like? And so in light of that, there's been this shotgun approach. That is this spray shot approach. Just throw everything at the wall and hopefully something sticks. Something works in this time. It's it's been a bit of a panic response. As far as I can tell, there's been a profound lack of prayer and trust. Uh, We take this to God and we say, look, ultimately you're in control, God. We trust you that whatever happens out the other side of this, we're here to serve you. That we'll be here to shepherd the people you provide. You see, I think as leaders of the church, we've often forgot That from our own scriptures, we know that God has used these situations as refining times for His people. And maybe this too is one of those refining moments. Burning off dross. Refining the precious metal. and The calling of His people. I had a chance to, to spend some time with a pretty incredible pastor several years back. In fact, he's a a pastor to pastors uh, in eastern part of Nigeria, northeastern part of Nigeria. Going back to the World Watch list, uh, Nigeria is ranked number two, the second highest country in the world for religious violence. Where does most of that violence happen? In the eastern part, northeastern part. The most deadly uh, terrorist group in the world, the Boko Haram, 
has set up shop in that area. And this pastor, pastors, other pastors in, in several churches in this area oversees these churches that are, that are existing under the threat of the Boko Haram. And uh, at one point I got to do an interview with this pastor. And I was doing an interview for a class that I was teaching. He wasn't going to be there for the class. I couldn't bring him in in person. And so we did this recorded interview. And I asked him in the interview, I said, what is the, the number one threat that is facing the people you serve in Nigeria right now? I wasn't trying to lead him into this question, but every part of me expected him to say, look, the Christians that I serve, every single one of them has family members with missing limbs or family members who have been killed because of their faith. And so I expected him to say, well, existing and worshiping and and staying strong under religious persecution is the biggest threat. But that's not what he said at all. Without hesitation, he said, the number one threat that faces my people in Nigeria is the influence of Western Christians who have brought a false gospel that have said the gospel of Jesus Christ will make you wealthy and healthy and prosperous in this life. He says it's destroying the churches I serve. Friends, my my basic point is this. Even if we do consider what we're going through in a global pandemic, a a form of persecution in some way, and again, I'm I'm sort of dubious of of phrasing it that way. I want to say something like the outcomes or the results of what we're going through look an awful lot like persecution. Persecution. Maybe it's not the worst thing. I don't say that lightly. I'm not praying for this. I'm not asking for this. I don't look around and think, oh, this is wonderful. This is great. But when I take it to God in prayer and I remember the refining fire that He can bring, I can... Leave it with Him. And trust that He knows what He's doing. That He can use that refining experience, that crisis and chaos, to actually embolden and empower the church in new ways. New ways that maybe the Western church has never, ever seen before. Maybe we'll begin to understand the real cost of what it means to follow Jesus. One truth I always try to highlight for my students as I teach church history is the fact that it seems to me that one of the greatest joys we have as Christians is the lack of wisdom the devil has. That the devil always seems to overplay his hand. He gets a little too excited, a little too antsy. In fact, you could tell the story of of the church, followers of the way, through the last 2,000 years, through the lens of persecution itself. Every time it's, it's placed on the church, every time it's pushed just almost to extinction, what happens after? It flames up again. And over and over this happens. It's like the devil gets too excited and thinks that he can actually do what he can't do. It's like blowing on a campfire. You ever blown on a campfire when you're trying to to light it, right? When you blow on it, it almost seems like the flame's going to go out. But as soon as the oxygen hits, right? We have to trust that God knows what He is doing in our world. In trying to break the church And those followers of the way, our text shows us that what? It actually strengthens them. It emboldens them and empowers them to be refugee missionaries. There's this wonderful quote. David Curry is the the president and CEO of Open Doors, who puts out the world watch list that we've been talking about this morning. I, I was completely struck by this quote in the report as I read it. I I just have to share it with you this morning. David says, look, you might think that this list is about oppression. But the list is really about resilience. What a wonderful way to look at 
Christians in the world who are under persecution. I hope that even through something like this, an experience of a global pandemic, that out the other side, people are able to look at the Western Church, at, at Oak Park Church of Christ, and say, it's really about resilience in their faith. But there's another side of me that says, uh, no. This global pandemic has, has not brought about persecution on the church. If we think having to do life groups via Zoom or Lane missing out on his morning coffee on Sunday mornings is somehow persecution, then I think we probably have a lot to experience and a lot to learn. A lot of things to consider, like the world watch list and just how cushy we have it as Western Christians. Let me tell you another story of another pastor I knew. And again, I had a chance to spend some time with this amazing pastor. Uh, he had done ministry in the Western world and um, had decided that he was being called to the Middle East. And he began, he actually revived a church that had existed a long time ago in Baghdad, Iraq. Uh, if you know nothing about the situation over the last 10 years, uh, Iraq has been extremely hostile to Christians. The church was growing incredibly. In fact, several thousand members of this church. He told this story. And maybe I'll just give a little bit of a warning if there's young ears listening. This, this isn't appropriate for all ages. He told the story of a, a man coming to him one day uh, completely distraught, uh, bawling and just uh, completely overwhelmed. And finally he, he calmed him down and he asked him uh, what the matter was, what was going on. And the man just kept saying, well, will Jesus only, you know, he, he didn't use the word Jesus in his own language, would, will Jesus forgive me? Will Jesus forgive me? I need forgiveness. Will he ever forgive me? How could he forgive me? The pastor said, well, what's going on? What, what do you need forgiveness for? Of course Jesus will forgive you. He said, I was at my home doing work and ISIS showed up. He said, they dragged me out and they said, we understand that you've become a Christian. And I said, yes, and I was strong in my conviction. And they said, we want you to renounce, to denounce Jesus. And he said, no, I won't do that. I'll remain firm in my calling. And he said, well, we'll kill you. He said, I won't denounce Jesus. They said they turned and looked in the house and they said, we'll kill your children. We'll kill your wife. The man said, I did it. I denounced Jesus. I read what they asked me to read. I, I did what they asked me to do. He said, I, I'm so overwhelmed. He said, when they left, my children were so distraught. They said, how could you do that? We love Jesus. Why would you do that, Father? He said, I need forgiveness. Can Jesus ever forgive me? And this pastor did what, what he absolutely should have. And he said, of course. Of course Jesus will forgive you. You're doing what any of us would have done. You're, you're protecting those you love and care about. He said, let's pray. And they prayed a prayer of forgiveness together. The next day, Isis came to his house. Only he wasn't there, and his wife wasn't there. And they brought the children out, and they asked them to renounce Jesus. They wouldn't. And they cut off the heads of those children. And they put them in the middle of a compound so that everyone could see. This pastor tells about how uncontrollably he was weeping. And at that time, there were some other children in the same complex, the same compound, who had become Christians. And they came to visit him. And he couldn't, he couldn't compose himself. And the children were not crying at all. And they, they said to him, Pastor, why, why are you crying? And he said, I'm, I'm so upset. I'm mourning what has happened. The evil that is in this world. And the children said, Pastor, don't worry. He said, we had dreams last night. 
the children, they were, they were dancing with Jesus. Friends, until we understand the conviction and the commitment that the gospel calls us to, we are never going to understand the depth of conviction and commitment that God had in sending his son to die for us. This is the gospel. That he would sacrifice his own son for you and for all. Ugandan church leader Festo Kivangari once said, it was actually on the anniversary of his colleague's martyrdom that he gave this sermon. He said, without bleeding, the church fails to bless. My point this morning is not to somehow layer on a sense of guilt or shame In saying that, no, this is not persecution in what we're experiencing. I'm not trying to lighten or lessen what we're actually going through. The stress, the crisis, and the chaos. I'm very aware and and, and I'm experiencing the weight of this pandemic myself. We're tired. We're more on the edge than we've ever been with our colleagues, with our children, as parents, with our spouse ourselves we're discouraged we're struggling with mental health issues anxiety emotional stability my point in all of this is that we need to learn again over and over again to lean on God we need to assess what our cares ought to be and what we actually need to release. And to say, this doesn't matter. This should not be my priority and my care. I need to hand over control to the one who is in control. Friends, I, I suggest there's actually no better, there's no greater time to do that handing over than in the middle of something like this. Th- this actually creates an opportunity for us to do that reassessment to reprioritize our lives. To give up some of those idols that we talked about last week where we put God in a box. We're invited to take stock of where our commitments lie, what it means to follow Jesus even in the midst of hardship. It will be hard. That's a promise of the Gospel. It's an invitation to say, do we really fully understand the implications of what a faith in Jesus Christ is? Can we honestly say that even now in a pandemic, that we are striving to do everything we can do to grow and mature in our faith? Or have we said, well, it's really hard right now. Maybe I'll pick it back up later. we can continue asking God to shape us in the midst of this crisis. You see, the heat has made us more malleable. And so the question for us is, what way do we want to be formed and shaped? Do we want to look more like Jesus Christ, or do we want to look more like the world around us? And finally, I think it's also an opportunity and a challenge to us as a church, as a family. See, I, I think in situations like this, we can actually go in two very different directions. We, we can let the, the crisis and the chaos and the heat of the situation lead us into division, into playing that blame game, into saying, oh, it's too hard, it's your fault. Right? Allowing that on-edgeness to get after each other. Or like that early church in the book of Acts, we can say, look, the heat can bind us together. It can can make us more radically one, more radically belonging to each other, a part of a mission, a common mission, so that we can be gracious with each other as we carry out this mission and ministry in the world. 
You see, I think this can be a defining moment for our church community. But we've got to decide which way we want to go. Let's pray. Father, it's, it's difficult to tell stories like that. but it's challenging to our own faith. To know that there are children in this world that face such things. That to claim your name costs them their lives. Lord, we are stressed and we are overwhelmed. We are tired. We are agitated. But we still have a choice. So we ask for your Spirit to work powerfully among us. That that this situation would bind us together even more strongly. That out of this, we would be more confident of our call to follow you as disciples. To mature in our faith, even to the point of it being costly for us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you.
as we come again, as we do each week to the Lord's table, uh, I wanted to read you one of my favorite passages and just reflect a little bit on what we shared this morning. This comes from 1 Corinthians 10, starting in the 14th verse. Paul says, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. This is what we talked about last week. It doesn't necessarily mean these little idols that we make with human hands but it can mean any way we put God in a box, any way we limit him or rule him out of areas of our life. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share in one loaf. We may partake this morning separate, (laughs) virtually, wherever you're watching this service, but it is one loaf that we partake from. It is one cup that we partake from. Every time I read this passage, I'm struck by that, that word, participation. You know, this is the most used word in the history of the church for what salvation is. That we are united. We are in union. We participate with Christ. This is what we we proclaim in the baptismal tank. That you are buried with the death of Christ. You are raised again in the life of Christ. You see, we talk a lot about the benefits of Christ. That His death has washed us clean. And of course that's scriptural. Of course that is the Gospel. But even more woven into the New Testament, we read these words that that in proclaiming the name of Christ, we participate with Him. We are united with Him. We suffer with Him. We die with Him so that we can experience new life, so that we too can dance with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, this meal, each and every time we come to the table, we're reminded that it is with you and because of you. That you are the loaf and the cup from which we participate. That you are the host that has invited us to this banquet feast. That You are the hope and the promise of what is to come. That our life will be hid with You in God. Thank You for these gifts. Costly, costly gifts of Your body and Your blood. In Jesus' name, by the power of the Spirit, we pray. Amen.
Yeah. 